Good morning and welcome to our Sunday School class virtual. Whether you're online at home or here in the sanctuary, we welcome you and appreciate um, your coming. Before we start, I, I have an apology to make. Uh, last week, I was talking about one of my heroes, Jack Reacher. And I mentioned the fact that I have become addicted to the books written by uh, David Balducci. Well, my wife, bless her heart, the librarian, when I get home, she says, sweetie face, Balducci didn't write Jack Reacher. It was Lee Childs. Lee Childs. So if you rushed out on Monday to get a Balducci book to read about Jack Reacher, I apologize, okay? It's, it's, Lee, good, it's, Lee, it's Lee Child. Yeah, Balducci writes good books. He has a hero too. Um, but anyway, I, I, I apologize. I, uh, I need to do my research better. Um, I'd like to start off with prayer if we, if we can. And my, the prayer today is going to come from Isaiah. And this is a prayer that I think, um, in light of what's taking place in our country with COVID, with the election, with the division that's taking place, and this is Christmas time, I think Isaiah has a great prayer for us. So it's in Isaiah chapter 9, and I'm going to read this as our opening prayer, along with the fact that I do pray that um, whether you're here in the sanctuary or at home virtually, that this lesson will be a blessing, it'll be informative, and um, applicable to our lives. So here's Isaiah's prayer for us, December 13th, 2020. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Amen to Isaiah's prayer. So if you have your Bibles at home or your iPad or whatever, it's Judges chapter 8. We'll be taking a look at this in sections, verses 1 to um, 30. We have a title, Gideon. Gideon takes three chapters. Gideon and Samson uh, constitute most of the chapters in the book of Judges. So this is, this is chapter 3, lesson 3 on Gideon. It's titled Gideon, an apod, Peace for 40 years, but, darn, but, okay? So here's how Judges 7 ended last week. Uh, Gideon and his 300 men are victorious over the Midianites. And they're chasing the remaining 15,000, 125,000 Midianites, apparently in the confusion of the night, when the lanterns were broken, when the bugles were blown, they killed themselves. 125,000 Midianites in that massive nightly confusion apparently killed themselves. That leaves 15,000. And that's who Gideon and his 300 are chasing. We ended with the tribe of Ephraim controlling the Jordan River. They capture two kings, Oreb and Jeob, and they bring their heads to Gideon. Now remember, a long time ago when I introduced Judges, I said it was a lot like reading Star Magazine or Tadler Magazine. There's a lot of gross stuff in there. So if you can just imagine the Ephronites coming with the heads of these two kings. And when we take a look at Judges 8, the killing is not over yet. Okay? So I think it's important that we take a look at these, at the tribe of Ephraim, and we take a look at Gideon. So we're going to take a look at a photo. And when you see this photo, you may scratch your head and ask yourself, what in the world, what in the world is this photo doing with this lesson? Well, let me, let me start off by the ending of, of chapter 7. So all the men of Ephraim were called out and they seized the waters of the Jordan as far as Beth Barak. They also captured two of the many night leaders, Horeb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued the Midianites and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan. The Ephronites were very important and instrumental in the victory, and Gideon was pleased. But a pancake has two sides. Would you agree? A pancake has two sides. So I want to start off by looking at this tribe that was so important at the end of chapter 7 to capture the kings, and the same tribe 
in Judges chapter 8, the first three verses. So here we go. Now the Ephronites, remember, they just captured the two kings, walked off their heads, brought them to Gideon. Thumbs up. Nice job. Now the Ephronites asked Gideon, Why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when you went to fight Midian? And they challenged him vigorously. In other words, they're in his face. Gideon, why didn't you call us? Doggone you. But he answered them. Notice this side of Gideon. What have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleanings of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grapes harvest of Abazir? God gave Orb and Zeb the many night leaders into your hands. What was I able to comprehend compared to you? Well, I'll tell you what you were able to do. You were able to subdue 125,000. That's not what he says. What was I able to do compared to what you did? At this, the resentment against him subsided. Pancake has two sides, right? So let's take a, let's take a look at Ephraim. Ephraim was a son born to Joseph in Egypt, okay? He was the grandson of Jacob. Are you with me? In Egypt, okay. He was blessed by Jacob over his older brother, Manasseh. Manasseh is the older brother. By Jewish rights, Manasseh should have been blessed by Jacob. He was not. The younger son was blessed by Jacob. And this is going to be a thorny issue. Okay? Now, Ephraim means doubly faithful. And it became the most powerful tribe of the northern tribes. The ten tribes. Okay? Manasseh was the weakest. Why? Remember a long time ago, the Jordan River split the two tribes, you had half tribe on the east bank and half tribe on the west bank. The tribe of Manasseh was considered to be the weakest. What intrigues me about Gideon in these first three verses, one side is his diplomacy, his tact. So I'm going to give you a couple of words and in the audience I want you to fill in the blank. Are you ready? A soft answer turneth away wrath. A soft answer turns away wrath. Notice his answer. Your grapes are much better than ours. I couldn't have done it without your help. What was my power compared to yours? And after they challenged him vigorously at his comments, the resentment against him subsided. It subsided. A soft wrath turns away, a soft answer turns away wrath. So let's, let's ask a couple of questions. Another slide is coming up. Have you ever been in a situation like Gideon and you had to use diplomacy and tact and civility to defuse the issue? Anybody in the sanctuary ever had to do with that at home, at work, at school, in the factory, in the shop? And the answer is, Sure. Okay, I'm getting a, a lot of head, uh, heads nodding. Was it easy? How do you deal with folks who are jealous and envious? I mean, can't you just hear the tribe of Ephraim? Well, you know, hey, we're, we're a powerful tribe. Why didn't you call us? Why did you, why did you call that half tribe? I could just see it like this. I love basketball. So the coach calls timeout. And he sends in Ron Shepard, 5'10", 150. When sitting on the bench is somebody 6'10", 255 pounds, who has a wingspan of 8 feet. Now when he sees Ron Shepard, 5'9", 150 being sent in, what do you think that guy is thinking? Why is he sending him in? He's just a runt. I've got a wingspan of 8 feet. Jealousy? Envy? Rivalry? Is it easy to deal with complainers? Well, I'll tell you what I did as a teacher. It doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> it means I was lucky. Okay? I liked sometimes to give assignments 
on the weekends. I was just mean-spirited. Okay? I guess I like to hear my seniors grumble. Because then when they would grumble, I would always say this as they were whining. And don't do this. This is, this is pure sarcasm. But in church you have to confess, right? So while they're grumbling and, and complaining, I would say, you're whining, aren't you? Yeah. What kind of cheese do you want with your wine? Well, they'd laugh and I'd laugh and the bell would ring. The timing was wonderful. And on Monday, I would get the assignments. I don't think it's easy to always be civil, is it? It's not always easy to be civil and to control anger. But that's what he's going to do. This is one side of Gideon, I think, that's very positive. He's using civility and diplomacy. But the story continues. So I'm going to read now verses 4 to 12, if you want to follow along. 4 to 12. Gideon and his 300 men, exhausted, yet keeping up the pursuit, came to the Jordan and crossed it. He said to the men of Sukkot, Give my troops some bread. They're worn out, and I'm still pursuing Zeba and Zaluma, the kings of Midian, two other kings, still on the loose. But the officials of Zukkot said, Do you already have the heads, the hands, excuse me, do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zaluma in your possession? The Bible doesn't say, but Gideon's answer is no. <laughs> Well, why should we give bread to your troops then? Then Gideon replied, Pancakes, flip it, the other side of Gideon. Just for that. When the Lord has given Zeba and Zaluma into my hands, I will tear your flesh with desert thorns and briars. We've gone from civility and diplomacy and tact. Oh, your grapes are wonderful. Couldn't have done it without you to... Listen, when I catch those two kings, I'm coming back after you. You can see a map. You can see how close those two cities are. Okay? Well within walking distance. And these two cities are going to have a great uh, part to play in this story as it unwinds. So, Sukkoth, when I get done, I'm going to tear your flesh with desert thorns and briars. From there, he went up to Penel and he made the same request. Bread, food, water, my troops are exhausted. They answered the same as the men of Zuko's had. So he said to the men of Penel, When I return in triumph, I will tear down this tower. Cities in the Old Testament time then always had towers. It was a place where you would have your sentries on guard to look at the horizon to see if the troops were coming. It stored supplies, ammunition, food, water, bread. It was also a place to hide. It meant security, protection. I'm going to tear it down. The Bible doesn't say how. He just says, I'm going to tear down your tower when I get back. Now, Zebu and, Z and Zamuma were in Karkar with a force of about 15,000 men. All that were left of the armies of the eastern peoples, 125,000 swordsmen had fallen. Last Sunday's lesson. Gideon went up by the route of the nomads east of Nobah and Jogbaha and attacked the unsuspecting army, caught him off guard. Zeba and Zaluma, the two kings of Midian, fled, but he pursued them and captured them, routing the entire army. So there you see those two cities, those two towns. Penel means face of vision or God, and Sukkoth may refer, may refer to the stops that the Hebrews made during their years of wandering, or it could refer to a festival, which the Jews celebrated when they pitched their tents, either which it has some kind of an important meaning to the Jewish people. Gideon does what any commander in chief would do. My troops are tired. They're hungry. They're thirsty. Can you help us? Can you help us? And what do the town people say? What do the townspeople say? No! There's no victory parade. There's no rejoicing. There's no ticker tape parade like we saw at the end of World War II. There were no people out in the streets to welcome them. I remember when I used to teach U.S. history, I loved showing um, the old black and white Bell and Howell films of the American soldiers 
coming back from World War II, and in New York, and Boston, and Los Angeles, the parade ground just lined with thousands and thousands of people, and American flags, and, and, and you know, confetti being thrown, welcoming back the victorious allies, not for Gideon. Now there's a reason, there's a reason. The people in those two towns, they looked around and they saw Gideon and what? Gideon and <laughs> 300 very tired, very worn out, very hungry, very thirsty soldiers. The Midianite kings were still on the loose. You know what they're thinking? They're thinking, if we give them food and water and spears and bow and arrows and word gets out to those two kings who are in flight and those 15,000 troops, comma, I'll bet you they will come back and get us. They'll come back and attack our city. They'll come back and attack our cities because they're on the loose. You know what? The people in those two towns, they saw a glass of water. And the glass of water was half full, half full or half empty. Which was it? Well, they weren't real bright either way. <laughs> if, they didn't, if they didn't bother to give the team, he's already told them, I'm coming back to tear you out. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, I just wonder what would have happened if they would have said how the story would be different if they would have said, sure, here's water, here's food, here's bread, here's bow and arrows. But they didn't. And that's going to lead to the other side of Gideon, which I have to be honest with you, I never ever thought about this side of Gideon. I always thought of Gideon as the great judge, the story of the fleece, tear down his father's altar to Baal, a great commander in chief. I never saw the other side of Gideon until you get to Judges chapter 8. That's why at the beginning, the pancake. So I think the people in, in, in these towns, they're scared. So here's some questions. Where was their focus? Was it on Gideon, a man of God? On a bunch of tired and worn out soldiers? Or these two kings who may seek revenge? And I'll bet you, I'll bet you, in your family, in your neighborhood, where you work, at your school, in your church, I'll bet you there are people, and I'm not trying to be negative, but I'll bet you there are people that you know in your circle of friends who always see the glass half empty. We've never done that before. We can't do that. We're too small. We don't have enough volunteers. We've never done it before. We don't have, we don't, have. that's when you say, what kind of cheese do you want with your wine? So we're going to see what happens to these, um, to these two cities. They want to maintain good relations. They want to maintain good relations with those two, two kings. I understand that. So now I'm going to do a little bit of an advertisement. Um, Laura is going to pull up um, something, a video, that you might be interested in. And I'm showing you this for two reasons. One, if you love history, especially history of the West, people like... Um, Crazy Horse, City Bull, Lieutenant General George Custer, Jesse James, Frank James, Billy the Kid, I heartily recommend this series. It's a really good in-depth look at American history without the drama. But I show this for another reason. If you take the time to rent that video or stream it, whatever, or if you do some Google research about Jesse James and Billy the Kid, Jesse James was operating in Missouri, Bill the Kid in New Mexico. It's very difficult for the law enforcement officials to get volunteers, to get a posse, to go out and look for Billy the Kid. I mean, he only killed nine people. And Jesse James had robbed numerous railroad trains and had killed some people. It's very difficult to get volunteers. You know why? Pardon? They were local heroes, and if word gets out, if word gets out that we fed Billy the Kid, gave Jesse James a horse, provided a false alibi, and Billy the Kid finds out, you know what he's going to do? He's going to come back for us. 
I understand why the people in those two towns were scared. I'd be scared too. Because all I would see is a bunch of tired troops with 15,000 out about nearby. So if you decide to watch that, I think you'll see that theme carried throughout as the marshals tried to recruit volunteers to track these two people down. It was very difficult uh, to do that. So I guess the question is this. Do you think the people in those two towns had a legitimate fear or was it blown out of proportion? As we work our way through Judges chapter 8, perhaps that answer um, will become clear. But we've seen now two sides of Gideon. It gets a little bit better. We're going to pick up now in verse 13, if you want to follow along. Verse 13. Gideon, son of Joash, then returned from the battle by the pass of Herod. He caught a young man of Sukkoth and questioned him. Think interrogation. And the young man wrote down for him the names of the 77 officials of Sukkoth, the elders of the town. The 77 elders of the town who said what to Gideon? Take a hike. No food. No supplies. Now i got to be honest. In researching that paragraph, you know what struck me as funny? If I would have been that young man and Gideon would have captured me and he said, okay, shepherd, give me the names of those 77 men, I'd have been hard-pressed to have named seven. Margot will tell you I am terrible with names. I really am. I always have been. When I taught at West Georgia, I had the students uh, make what they were called name tents. I'd give them a piece of cardboard, they'd fold it over and they would type their name really big because I only met them once a week. I wanted to make sure I knew their names. It took me five years to learn some students' names and by that time they'd graduated. I could not come up with 77 names, but this lad did. So now Gideon has the names of 77 elders. Notice what he's going to do. Then Gideon came and said to the men of Sukkoth, Here are Zeba and Saluma, about whom you taunted me by saying, Do you already have the hands of Zeba and Saluma in your possession? Why should we give bread to your exhausted men? He took the elders of the town and taught the men of Sukkoth a lesson by punishing them with desert thorns and briars. He also pulled down the tired Penel and killed the men of the town. You're looking at some briars. Several commentators suggest that the 77 men were not only whipped with those briars, they were executed in the public plaza. I don't know. Mine just says, punishing them with desert thorns and briars. Several commentators said that punishment meant death. If so, 77 men were executed in the town plaza. What we do know is they pulled down the tower. How, I don't know. Maybe they tied some rope around the tower and got some oxen and pulled the base down. I really don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But it does say they pulled the tower and they killed the men of the town. Is this a sight of Gideon you ever had read about? Does this change your opinion of Gideon. Something to think about. Because he's not done. He's not, he's not done. Okay? So, um, we go on. I'm going to pick up now in, in, um, in verse 18. Okay? Then he asked Zeba and Saluma, the two kings, what kind of men did you kill at Tabor? They answered, men like you, each one with the bearing of a prince. Gideon replied, well, those are my brothers the sons of my own mothers. And that could mean literally his brothers, or it could mean family members extended, or it could mean colleagues, kinsmen, fellow tribesmen. Your commentators can probably clarify that. As surely as the Lord lives, if you had spared their lives, I would not kill you. Turning to Jether, his oldest son, he said, kill him. But Jether did not draw his sword because he was only a boy and he was afraid. Zeba and Saluma said, Hey, do it yourself, Gideon. As is the man, so is his strength. 
I think what they're saying is, hey Gideon, we're commander-in-chiefs, we're king, we're powerful, you're kind of like a king, you're a commander-in-chief, kill us, you kill us. So Gideon stepped forward and killed them and took the ornaments off their camel necks. Whereas he was civil at the beginning, diplomatic at the beginning, we now see a more warlike Gideon. And you can see that thorn whip. So, let's talk about camels. Gideon took the ornaments off the camels next. There you have a camel. It's ordained. Attractive, is it not? You could take the ornaments in the gold and the silver and the cloth and you could go to the marketplace and you could sell that for lots and lots and lots of money. And this is another side of Gideon that I would like to take a look at. Okay, so I'm going to pick up now with verse 22 as he takes the ornaments off of these necks, off, off of the necks. Okay? The Israelites said to Gideon, once they've seen the two kings beheaded, rule over us, you, your son and grandson. By the way, it's interesting. If I, if I can go back for just a moment about um, Gideon asking his son, one of the worst things that could happen to a king or a prince would be to be executed by a teenager. So chances are that Gideon's son was a teenager. So I'm guessing the two kings were glad the teenager said no. I'm thinking they're glad they were killed by a person of kingly um, realm. All right. Rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you've saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. By the way, if you unpack Judges chapter 18, chapter 8, no place does God speak. That's worth repeating. Throughout Judges 8, God does not speak. He did in 6. He did in seven, but not in eight. So I'm left with this question, which I'm going to throw out with you. Is all this has taken place? Is this on Gideon? Are these Gideon ideas, his plan, his strategies? Where's God? When those 77 men were executed, where was God? When that tower was pulled down, where was God? When those kings were executed, where was God? You say, yeah, but Ron, that's the Old Testament. That's how it was done. That's how you treated kings. Yeah, you're right. That's how it was done. But was it done on God's orders? That's the question. Did God order Gideon to do these things? Okay, Gideon, I'll not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. But, now get this, get this. But he said, I do have a request that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was the custom of Israelites to, to wear gold earrings. They answered, yeah, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment, and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels. The commentators I used said between 43 and 50 pounds. That's a lot of gold. Not counting all the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments won by the kings of Midian, or the chains that were on the camel's Neck. Gideon has suddenly gotten a lot of spoils of war. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Oprah, his hometown. All Israel, all Israel prostituted. Some Bibles say whored, W H O R E D. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Now there you see an image of an ephod. And if you look real closely you can see 12 emeralds. One emerald for each of the 12 tribes. The only person who was supposed to wear that was the high priest when he worshipped in the movable tabernacle and when he started worshipping in the temple in Jerusalem. 
This is what Gideon may have made. Now, why was it worn? Well, the high priest would wear this and he would pray for God's direction, God's will, God's enlightenment. So it was kind of like a, a lucky charm in a way and the high priest would pray with that on his chest and then he would give the answer to prayer to the Israelites. Apparently, what Gideon has done, he's taken the spoils of war and turned them into an ephod, an idol. One commentator said it was not unusual for a typical Hebrew woman to wear 15 earrings dangling all the way down on their chest and shoulders. What I'm suggesting is Gideon is getting a lot of money and he's turning it into an ephod. So, and remember, <laughs> this is the same Gideon who destroyed his father's idols. And now here, Gideon, we think, has made an iPod, ephod in his hometown. But let, let's unpack and see how this and see how this ends, okay? All right. Picking up in verse 29, 28, I'm sorry. Thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace for 40 years. As we continue our journey through Judges, it's not unusual for peace to last 40 years. That'll be a number that will keep cropping up. Jerob Baal, son of Joash, Jerob Baal, Gideon's new name, went back home to live. He had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine, remember, uh, Randy talked about a concubine last week. A concubine was kind of like a secondary wife. She would live with her husband, would have all the duties of a wife, but she would not have the status of a wife. She would not have the elevation of a wife. Kind of a secondary wife. So he's got a concubine who lived in Shechem and who bore him a son whom he named Abimelech. He's chapter 9 and Katie barred the door. I hope you'll read ahead in chapter 9. Whether you're here on site or at home, I think you'll find very interesting what this guy is going to do. Okay, this is Gideon's son. Gideon's son of Joash died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Oprah. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Bereth as their god and did not remember the Lord their god who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. Remember just a few minutes ago in Randy's sermon? He talked about how the Israelites would forget, 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 forget. Boom. Gideon's dead and they forget. But that's not all. The people also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Gideon in spite of all the good things he had done for them. So as we begin to, as we begin to unwrap this, apparently in his hometown he has this idol and apparently the people are worshiping this idol. Question, yeah. What was his motive in doing this? Was it a motive to worship him? Was it a motive to worship God? Was it a motive to have the people remember what God did? I don't know. Maybe it was a good motive that backfired. Maybe it was a good idea. And maybe Gideon didn't think the people would worship this idol. But they will. And it's going to ruin them and it's going to ruin Gideon's family. So you see, so you have some questions there. And I, I want to jump over because you can't, we, can't really, we can't really understand the importance of this idol, this ephod, unless we take a look at something in chapter 17. So I'm just going to read chapter 17 about a man named Micah. Now this is not the prophet. This is just a man named Micah, M-I-C-A-H. Now this man, Micah, had a shrine. And he made an ephod and some household gods and installed one of his sons as his priest. Can't do that. Only a Levite can be a priest. You can't just appoint your son as priest. Only God can do that. 
So here's Micah over in chapter 17 making an idol, making an epoch, and appointing his son as priest. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. So I'm going to skip over real fast to chapter 18. Make a short story long. The tribe of Dan will invade this town. They will conquer this town. They will overthrow Micah's house. And they will take Micah's priest and Micah's idols and leave town. And Micah will run after them, yelling, You've got my priest. You've got my gods that I made. Give them back. <clears throat> the Danites will not. I'm going to read what one man, individual, he started out in his house, what one man can do that can lead a country astray. I'm reading from 18. I'm going to start in verse 28. The Danites rebuilt the city and settled there. They named it Dan after their ancestor, Dan, who was born to Israel, though the city used to be called Lesh. There the Danites set up for themselves the idol. And Jonathan, son of Gershon, grandson of Moses, grandson of Moses, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of captivity of the land. They continued to use the idol Micah had made all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. Shiloh was to be the capital, the house of God. Now you've got one in Oprah. The Israelites have a problem. So here's, here's some questions. Is Gideon living like a king? Does he have the wealth of a king? You've got to be wealthy to have 70 wives. You say, well, that's not very many. Solomon had how many? Solomon had how many wives? 600. 700. 700. And how many concubines? 300. 300. David had many wives. In Scripture, eight are named. You see, monogamy was practiced in the Old Testament. It's, it was legitimate. It wasn't God's plan. In Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, he talked about one man, one woman, the woman will leave her family and be joined with her husband. And we find this, you see some New Testament qualifications there, where Jesus says, one man, one wife. So in Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 4, man leaves his mom and dad to be married to his wife. And when you read the section on 1 Timothy, two elders and deacons, the elder and the deacon will be the husband of one wife. But in the Old Testament, monogamy was practiced. Not so, not supposed to be in the New Testament. So now I want to close. I want to close with just a series of questions and then a watch. Okay, so here's my, here's my questions. We've looked at several sides of Gideon. Gideon began well, but ended. How would you fill that in? Poorly. Poorly. What about us? Might we do something with the proper motive only to have it backfire. And yet, I've been talking negatively about Gideon, yet in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, guess who's in the Hebrews Hall of Fame? Gideon. So I want to close with something from Dean Collins, who is Dean of Point University. And Laura's going to pull up to you a watch. Every day, Dean Collins sends out email. And he sends one to Sandy Berling, which he forwards to me. There's his watch. The dean has bought a watch which tells his number of steps, his heart rate, blood pressure, hours slept, calories burned, and his oxygen level. Maybe some of you people have one of those. Maybe when you do you walking or you do chores, you, you press that walk and you can see those things. Dean Collins' email this week said, Maybe we need a spiritual app that measures my motives, my acts of love, my kindness, my acts of generosity, my patience, and my humility. It's easy to judge Gideon. And I'll be the first to admit in teaching, I've probably given a negative side of Gideon today. But what about my motives? <laughs> what about my motives? Gideon 
is in Hebrews chapter 11, the Hall of Fame. Will I, will you, if I had a spiritual act that measured my Christianity, my Christian walk, my Christian talk, what would that act say about me and my motives? Because every one of us has two sides to our life's pancake. Father God, I pray that the sides of our life's pancake are pleasing to you. And it's easy to beat up on Gideon and his motives, but then we have to look in the mirror and look at our spiritual app 